Hey folks, Roland Martin here, host of Managing Editor, Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's continue our conversation dealing with the issue of race in America. What is the responsibility of white privilege? My guest, Chad Smith, a comedic YouTube content creator with over 800,000 subscribers and 44 million views. Also, Michael Skolnick. He is an entrepreneur, film producer, news commentator, civil rights activist, and motivational speaker. Michael doesn't have enough to do. He's a partner and co-founder of the Soze Agency. Previously, he was the president of GlobalGrind.com. And closing us out, Eddie Glaude Jr., an American academic, chair of the Department of African American Studies, and the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. He's a double-sided business card, Eddie. He's also an MSNBC contributor. All right, folks, let's get right into it. Uh, Michael, I want to start with you. You're the resident white guy in our panel. Um, the responsibility of white privilege. We're seeing companies responding. We're seeing politicians. But are we seeing a real response to race in America? Well, Roland, I've certainly gotten older over the years, and I've seen a lot in this country. It is not enough for us white people just to recognize our privilege or speak of our privilege or talk about our privilege. We must act uh, on that privilege, and we must act to dismantle the systems and the structures that hold up uh, the 400 plus uh, year history of racism in this country. So as an ally, uh, I have spent the majority of my life to move from an ally to an accomplice. It is no longer good enough just to be an ally. It's no longer good enough just to say I'm going to show up for black people. I'm going to show up when people have asked for me to show up. We also have to show up when they are not asking. We have to show up when they are not the ones in the street. When we are in our family rooms or in our dining room tables or having conversations at our jobs, Eddie, you're at Princeton. You, they've had to deal with these issues. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, very racist president. Uh, that's they, This has been an issue on college campuses, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way in which Princeton narrates his history, black folk are like latecomers. We are the recipients of charity. We're not integral parts of the story of Princeton. And so part of what the students were demanding in that moment is, is really how do you tell a story of Princeton that is not heralding a past, but actually uh, is aspirational, that actually reflects the current Princeton of today and the values that animate and organize uh, the institution. And this is really important. Usually when there's a critique of white allyship, what, what, is, what is being spoken of is that there is a view of racial justice that's being held and, and, and proposed by our quote-unquote white friends that's philanthropic in its orientation, that they view racial justice as a charitable enterprise, something to be given, right? Um, and as long as we think about racial justice in that way, we're caught within the frame. So we have to have our white brothers and sisters deconstruct this idea that racial justice, that justice period, is a gift that they can give to anyone. It's not theirs to give anyone because it's not their possession. Uh, Chaz, in Dr. King's book, Chaos or Community, where do we go from here? He literally talked about that. He said how white America was not fully prepared to even deal with the history of this country because they've never really confronted it. Isn't that the same with white privilege, that there are people who say, wait a minute, I don't have any white privilege, and they're white. Right, right. White people believe that they don't have privilege is because they just don't experience what we experience as minorities. I can say that myself as a man, I don't experience the same things that a lot of women do. I realize, whoa, okay, there might be something else going on here. Michael, it's part of the problem, the phrase white privilege anyway, because when people hear that, they think, oh, privilege means, oh, rich people. And so there are people who say, I don't have any money, I'm broke, so therefore I don't have white privilege. Yeah, I mean, also privilege also insinuates there's a superiority even in that saying white privilege. It still reinforces at times, you know, the racism, the inherent racism that, you know, is, is in this country. But I also want to say, Roland, as white people, racial justice is not about us giving black people anything. Racial justice is also about liberating ourselves from the racism that has been ingrained in us since we've been children, since we've been taught as young people in this country to believe we're better, to believe we're superior, to believe that we're smarter, to believe all these things that are not true. And so our job of recognizing that that privilege inside of us is to relieve ourselves of that cancer, which is racism, to get rid of it so we can liberate our minds and be in much greater relationship with those black brothers and sisters and Latinx brothers and sisters, and AAPI brothers and sisters, so we have removed ourselves of that disease of racism or uh, alleviated ourselves of that disease of racism or elevated our minds to a greater level of consciousness 
by doing the work to recognize what we have and what that privilege does to us, which creates that cancer and creates that disease, which I don't want. And for my white brothers and sisters who are watching out, I promise you, you don't want. And it's part of the problem, and I'm not letting anybody off the hook, but this is part of the problem that we're dealing with white folks, just like black folks, who've had to learn his story and not actual history. And so it becomes, well, no, this, this is what I was taught. I didn't know these things. There are people who say, geez, I, I was an adult before I actually learned about uh, these real issues. Isn't this also part of the problem with white privilege and what we're confronting in America right now? You know, Roland, that's such a great question. You know, and in some ways we have to describe it as a kind of willful ignorance. And I think part of what has to happen, I think, is a kind of re-narration, uh, a kind of retelling of who we are. That's what the 1619 Project sought to do. We, it brought up a whole host of questions, but it sought to re-narrate the story. When we begin to tell ourselves a different story about the evils, about the cruelty, about the joys, about the triumphs, where black folk and brown folk are not objects of charity or we're not latecomers or we're not being civilized, but we're co-participants in the project, then we open up space to imagine ourselves differently. I'm really honestly believing and hoping that this will not just be a trend, that um, people are truly going to begin to see people of all colors and ethnicities and backgrounds as equals, um, that people will begin to have equal opportunities, that these systems that have that have been that America was built on are going to begin to be stripped away, and the foundations will be rebuilt um, in ways that all people have greater opportunities to push for what we know is right. Michael, what is a white ally? What, what does a white ally look like, and what sort of things they should be mindful of when it comes to language and also leadership in black spaces? So one is first to believe black people. Two, in this moment and in this movement, this movement is leaderful. Don't think you are showing up with the answer. It is leaderful with black people. It is leader leaderful with black women. It is leaderful with queer black people. So when you go to the march, and please go to the march, bring your children, bring your loved ones, bring your parents, show up at the demonstration, show up at the protest. But when you go, ask, where can I be of service? Not how can I help? Where can I be of service? Should I march in the back? Should I march in the side? Should I put myself in between the police and you, where can I be of service? So first is recognizing your place in this moment. And so in those moments, speak up, stand up, say something. It is not about getting kudos or getting applause on social media or your black friends saying good job. It's about you knowing who you are as a human being and who you are as a white person and saying that I am not going to witness this and be silent. That to me is the next step of where us white people have to go beyond allyship into a level that this is, as, as Eddie said, this is not charity work. This is liberation work for us too. Mm. For, to carry that disease in your head, when you get cancer, I'll shut up, I speak too much, but when you get cancer, people tell you, I hope you get through it. I hope you I, F cancer. Racism is a cancer. Get, I want it out of my system. I have to do the work to get it out of my system. And I, I, I beg, I urge any white person watching this who feels that sensation of racism inside of them to look deep inside of them and say, do they want to live a life of fear, a life of hate, a life of pain? Or do they want to live a life of joy and liberation and freedom? Jimmy Baldwin makes a distinction in the evidence of things not seen between white people and people who happen to be white. And he says, I love, I happen That's to love right. a lot of people who happen to be white, and then there's white people. And he's trying to get, oh, get us the sense of what the ideology of whiteness is doing to overdetermine how mm -hmm. one understands oneself. Michael Scott, <sighs> Eddie Glott, Chad Smith. Gentlemen, we appreciate it.